So welcome everybody to uh, Tantra of Shaft, the lunchtime lectures. Today is all about kind of a entertaining but uh, informative talk around the trap. The enlightenment race, the rat race, and which other race are we actually in? So my name is Shaft Adin. I'm a transformational entertainer bit of a rock star. I travel the world, activating uh, countries and communities. Um, I was just in Finland in front of 13,000 people doing uh, the Shaft Show, which is bringing all of these esoteric practices I've learned from breath work, uh, full body orgasms, to Karma Sutra, Shafta Sutra, to enlightenment practices from the original Tantric texts, and just brought it all together in a very fun uh, show so everyone gets to be enlightened so it's not just for monks who live in caves for 15 years now who here has heard of the rat race raise your hands does anyone know how to win the rat race it's usually three things it's uh losing something of these three losing your mind losing your health losing your job and you win the rat race by getting to the top and you fall off. So the rat race would be something along the lines of get married, get educated, get a job, make sure you stay at the job until you retire, and make sure you have kids. And you have to basically have to, you have to do a lot of stuff dead people told you to do. And in that way, you'll be happy. Um, and a lot of people tried it. I tried it. And is there any uh, overachievers in the house? Yep, yep. Any perfectionists? Highly controlling, bit of OCD. <laughs> so with that mentality, you will win the rat race and you may burn out. And then you have to take a little bit of time off work just to heal. So once you've got to the top of the rat race, you've ticked all the boxes, a lot of people um, don't find true fulfillment, even when I have children and marriage and job and everything. Everything's perfect on the inside, but on the, uh, on the outside, but on the inside, something's still missing. I know I achieved a lot. Um, I, I love the rat race. I live by a mantra, which was ignorance is bliss. I didn't want to live a, a deep form of existence. I wanted to just live a shallow form of existence, make money, make love, and buy a house. That, that was it. And get married. I, I, I do love love. Love is one of my favorite things. And um, life turned out very interesting for me. I, um, my journey was one of extreme poverty. I come from a Bangladeshi Muslim household. My dad does a call to prayer. We were forced into being a Muslim. And not only was I brought up in England as a Muslim, which made me even more different from everybody else, uh, we had poverty mentality as well. So it's like many layers I had to break through. But I just decided not to think about anything. I actually started uh, being depressed at the age of eight. Um, I actually tried to take my own life when I was eight years old. I started super young. Um, from that moment, I realized that there's something wrong with life. And uh, are we really slaves to money? And then we die. And I just thought, okay, the only way to get out of this uh, prison I put myself into with my parents. I love my parents, by the way. I got mum tattooed on my back. But the major caregivers I had were very um, strong parents. They made sure I went to uh, the mosque every Sunday, read the Quran, uh, did my, my prayers and everything. I was, it was very rigid. But I always questioned everything. I was like, Mom, if I'm really going to hell for eternity and the human body adapts, surely after a while, this it burning in eternity would just feel normal and in the end it might actually be pleasurable. And I was like six years old when I questioned my mom like that. <laughs> Even in the mosque, I'd question like their belief systems and their, the reality I was forced to believe in. And then I learned English. I became British. 
And we have another conditioning on top of that in my country, which is a British politeness. So if someone says, if you're suffering and you're in pain and someone says, are you okay? And you'd be like, yeah, 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 sure, everything's fine. Or they overstep one of your boundaries and they say, uh, uh, how, how is it going? I'm like, oh, it's all fine. It's, everything's great. And you keep it at a bit of a distance. You never tell anyone anything you're actually feeling. The only time you might be a little bit open is if you start drinking. And I started drinking when I was 13. I actually became an alcoholic at the age of 13. So I never really knew who I was. So from the age of eight, when I decided to kill myself, I survived. I started writing a lot of poetry about the matrix and what is the point of life. Then I decided at the age of 13 to get educated, get out of Bexhill and become a graphic designer. And from there, when I chose that shallow form of existence, life was pretty easy. I was suppressing everything. And I was coping very well. I also thought I was super smart. I would have a problem and I would have 15 solutions to fix that problem and then 35 other backup solutions for that problem. Later I found out I had anxiety and it was worrying and really bad worrying and stress. But I just thought I was really clever running virtual simulations in my brain. So I had a lot of mental problems from addiction, depression, stress, dyslexia, a whole list of things. And it was only until I went to London and found my purpose, uh, which was, well, eventually I did, out of, out of all my friends, I was going to get married. So that was amazing. Um, but then my best friend um, slept with my fiance. Wasn't so great. But then I took her back and we we're going to crack on with the marriage. And then I caught her in bed with another guy. So that was a tragedy. After that, I became jobless, homeless, and suicidal. But it only took like meeting a new group of people uh, to actually find my purpose. I wanted to become a music video director and a graphic designer and an art director. And then I, I found this, uh, this cool gang I, I got in in London, team having it. And we started directing music videos and I eventually found a reason to live and another mantra which was, um, success is the best form of revenge. So if I ever saw my ex-girl, uh, fiance or my best friend ever again, I'd be like, screw you guys, I made it. And then eventually, just two years after all of this tragedy happened, a rock bottom, so to speak, I did buy a house and um, I was pretty much plain sailing from 2005 all the way to 2014. 2014 was when I actually fell off the rat race. I had my uh, burnout and has anyone been to Burning Man or heard of Burning Man? So I was kind of a bit of a character at Burning Man. I identified as a lesbian unicorn and in Burning Man I actually found my reality. I live by Star Wars and Star Trek, mainly Star Trek. So I have a very optimistic view around humanity. I actually believe we're actually going to do really great. And I really honestly believe like humanity is amazing. Even though I had horrible thoughts when I was little, but I really see goodness in human. Only because I started to feel goodness in myself. Like, what happens when you find love? You find a partner, then all your single friends, you want to help out your single friends. Because you feel joy and you want to share that joy. And I've realized that in myself. So when I actually started to find a thing called Burning Man, where money didn't exist and a utopian society existed, and you could be anything you actually wanted to be, I decided to be a unicorn. So I created this belief system in Jerusalem for Midburn in 2004, uh, 2012 or 14 or something like that. And I created the 10 principles to unicornia. It's a free love uh, type of belief system. And during this time, I had a vision when I was meditating in Jerusalem. I saw the, the wailing wall and the mosque on one side. I visualized myself coming out of my body as astral projection in a way. And I saw myself grow these giant wings. I had this crown on that I looked like a, a crusader from the ancient times. 
and I flew across the desert and I saw this war-torn area and I landed and I pulled out my sword, put it into the ground and all this glitter went everywhere and wherever the glitter touched, all of the people come out of their houses and they start being all fabulous and sexy and all of the, the mud and the rubble would turn into these uh, beautiful buildings and everyone would become um, sparkly. And then from that meditation, I went back to London and I, that's when I created my, uh, my global movement that reached millions and billions of people. Does anyone remember a time in human history when you couldn't pick something up unless it had a unicorn on it, like a unicorn mug, unicorn t-shirts, relationships as always a unicorn, billion dollar uh, companies were called unicorns, unicorns were everywhere. I decided to make that happen. Now, was I tapped into something else or did they believe in me? I don't know which way it works, but I was definitely tapped into something. And I very much didn't believe that one man could make a difference. And working in advertising, like by that time I was working at places like Saatchi and Saatchi, working on big brands like Mercedes, Coca-Cola, and I, and I loved my job. I also by that time would cycle around London. One of my big dreams came true of having my billboards all around London, and having one of my music videos on MTV, ba uh, MTV base as well. So I really cracked the code of the matrix and being in there without really having to struggle or work that hard. It was really, really, my job was so easy. I had severe dyslexia, so I couldn't read or write good. So I got really good at pictures. I was colorblind, but luckily they never knew about me being colorblind because there's a brand value a brand guidelines with hex values and rgb values and just copy and paste it no one will ever know so no one ever knew i was really good at surviving and adapting so when it came to creation i knew how to manipulate millions of people to feel so bad about themselves that they would buy items from oil of Oli. i'm a dude i got really good skin because I figured a few things out with this tantra stuff I'm going to talk about. But I don't, put, I don't put any products on my face. But I work for Oil of Ole and other cosmetic brands. And for some reason, people are buying loads of stuff to put on their faces when you don't really need much. Same with all the other products. We would invent up problems. And this is, this is inside information from Saatchi and Saatchi and all the other places I used to work at. We would just make up problems for things that no one had so we could sell you stuff that you don't need. And I loved it. I bought two houses from it. I had a really nice time. It wasn't a problem. But, you know, things like that slowly destroy you inside. It's not so fulfilling or enriching. But when I discovered the 10 principles of unicornia and I saw this vision, I decided to apply all, the, all of that mass manipulation of hating yourself into loving yourself. I thought, I wonder if I can make people feel love, self-love, for themselves, and then get everyone to stop drinking, put down their drinks and start dancing. I wonder if I could create a movement around that. So I started to analyze language, analyze religions, um, look at the way people find belonging, and I crafted this very, it looked very simple and fluffy and airy and ha 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 fun, but highly intricate belief system based on Islam, Christianity and everything like that. I wasn't spiritual at this point, by the way. I wasn't, I wasn't sober either. <laughs> so from 2010 to 2014, I developed this thing, which actually reached a global impact level, um, movement a tv company even ended up taking um well lots of newspaper articles lots of uh things were published around this thing called the fabulous of unicorns which was something i invented i was just me by myself going around pretending to be a unicorn now i wasn't hiding or pretending i literally thought i was a unicorn there was no distinction behind oh i wonder if it's a good idea um by this time, I got really into alternative festivals, especially Burning Man. And there's loads of offshoots of Burning Man. So uh, I, I found Burning Man in 2010. I discovered polyamory. I discovered 
like all these different other drugs that I could put in my face and I loved it. I thought this is the best thing in my life. But why is everyone waiting for five days and one week out of like the whole year to live that life? And then someone said, there's an even better festival in Sweden called uh, Borderland, which is like this, but full of Swedish people. I was like, oh, great. And then I heard about Nowhere Festival. Then I heard about Ness. And I heard about Wikipedia that has a whole list of these festivals. And I went home, found it, and I was like, I, there's one every weekend. I'm going to go. I was very, very rich. I was very, very successful. There wasn't any millionaires around back then. Six figures was like the bar you could go to in the matrix where I was living. Like a hundred thousand pounds a year was like the most anyone could ever dream of. Thirty thousand pounds a year as a graphic designer was like uh, you know mid to high level. And if you went anything above thirty k to hundred k, you're considered rich. Now people make that a month. But back then, in my matrix, that was like a lot of wealth. So I invested all of my time and money just going from festival to festival, meeting the most incredible people. And then one day I took a heroic dose of ketamine and I woke up and I thought I was a unicorn. And then I started prancing around the desert like this. I would meet other people and go high hoof. Um, I developed a whole language system and a whole belief system and the rest is digital history, history because major TV channels started filming this thing. It was a great success. I was a raging alcoholic, a raging drug addict, identified as a lesbian. I was surrounded by beautiful women, beautiful men. All the men were gay. I was hanging around in the, um, the drag queen scene and the performer scene. We we're, were on stage at Coco, we were performing at the Brits, we were backing dancers for Basement Jacks, who we were huge because one guy literally thought he was a unicorn. I had no other friends because they were all pirates and I was really sparkly and like spoke different to them. I got kicked out of my pirate community who were also burners, but I decided to just do what I loved, which was being myself and being a unicorn. And then one day, now if anyone's thinking of uh, starting a group or a movement, I found this method works very well. Um, the method is, if, if you're by yourself, great, everyone thinks you're insane, but you need one other person, preferably a hot blonde woman with big boobs, that's what happened to me that time. If it weren't for her, I would still be by myself. She just decided to be a part of this. It was never about me, it was about her. Because of her, it gave everyone permission, especially all the hot blonde women, to be like her. And all the guys, they wanted to have sex with her. Nothing to do with me, I'm just, I, I'm just still on my mission. So because of her, it allowed more people, and eventually hundreds of thousands and millions of people to join this thing called the Fabulous of Unicorn. To this day, it's still up on Facebook, Fabulous felt wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's still a living entity. Then, in 2014, something tragic happened to me. I couldn't get drunk. Now, for an alcoholic and a drug addict, if the drink wasn't working, then that rocket fuel that was inside of me, that was like charisma, confidence, none of that was working. So I actually couldn't dance on stage anymore. I was hired to make out with people at uh, clubs. That was my job. I couldn't do that anymore. We were hired to perform on big stages and make love with each other. I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't do anything anymore. My business, well, my friends couldn't connect with me anymore. No one understood how to engage with me because we only would meet to go and drink at a pub. I couldn't absorb the alcohol. My uh, job at Fox TV by this time, my boss even said, Shaft, you're really shit at your job now. Um, you're way better when you're drunk. I was like, I know. I know I was. <laughs> it's really shit. And then during this time, a major TV company decided to do a documentary about it. Imagine having a major nervous breakdown, a crisis, and a film company follows you around for one year, watching you go more and more insane. 
trying to understand what's going on, following you having therapy, and you are then this this video came out portrayed as being a massive failure to the point that you have to leave your own country you get kicked out of your own unicorn group that you built and during this time was the time when i escaped the rat race i started hearing voices i started seeing visions i started asking people am i going insane and everyone said, you need to go to the doctors, you need to go to the psychiatrist. I went to the therapist that um, people, like, the doctors gave me. And I used to take all the drugs. So I, after having therapy session, I wanted to take more heroin. I was like, this is terrible. Which means, someone said, uh, that means it was probably working. But I was like, this is terrible. No, I don't think she gets me. And then I met a therapist who identified as a fairy. And then I was able to talk to somebody that I could relate with and she could relate to me. And I, and I said, I want to achieve five things. I want to feel love in my heart, which I've never felt before unless I'm on MDMA. Um, I wanted to um, have this special kind of hug that you have that feels like your heart's being activated. It's like, I call it a heart hug, but I was feeling it when I was mainly on drugs. I wanted to be sober, stop smoking, stop taking drugs. And on the last bit was a thing called Tantra. I kept on hearing it over and over again. I, I ignored it, but it was like the, the last thing on the list. And she helped. The first thing I let go of was smoking. And I asked myself, why am I smoking? And the answer was, because I wanted to get fucked up. And then I was like, why do you want to get fucked up? And the answer was, it's because I hated my life so what do i need to do i need to love my life so i needed to learn how to love my life that's a really hard job when everything you've known was a lie and an illusion and not really real because all of my friends weren't really real because we only ever connected when we were drunk or when they needed something when i was ill or when i needed help none of my friends were there for me some of them did but it's only because i uh, created a, a support network for my friends these uh, I was the most mental out of all of them so all of these other unicorns we're all mentally insane <laughs> during COVID is a little tragedy on that website um, when I got sober I rescued myself and got therapy and I healed which I'll talk about in a minute but on that website there is a long list of RIPs because everyone ended up taking their own lives um, from overdose and it was a really sad time because everyone started to um, kill themselves especially during COVID no one really knew about wellness mental health meditation anything they just knew I just left them and they kept on doing what they were doing so when I eventually got kicked out of my own community that I created one of my unicorns shouted at me, Shaf, this isn't about you. This isn't the Shaf show. And I was like, it's not. It's never been about me. It's always been about the community. I always, I'm incredibly lonely. I want people to play with. Like, it's never been about I'm a narcissist manipulating people to, like, get whatever I want. It's more like I'm really fun. I want to have fun. I want people to have fun with. And that's always been my default setting, people to play with. And it was always about getting more and more people connected. So when uh, that one unicorn said that to me, that, that affected me so much that I left London and I left my community. And I do to this day have a brand called The Shaft Show, which is based on trauma. And again, success is the best form of revenge. I wouldn't advise this for anyone. I do. I, I'm a high level. Uh, I, I do coach people, but I, do, I never tell these stories to my my clients. It's all on YouTube, and that's all been taken down now. So, <laughs> so I decided to leave uh, the UK, and I went on my um, enlightenment race journey. 
Now this is just like the Matrix and the Rat Race, but this time it's worse. Because not only do you have to get educated, find love and get married, buy a house. This is way bigger now. So now you have to reach enlightenment. Not only when you reach enlightenment, you have to have an online course, become a world-class healer. Now you don't have to buy a house, you have to buy land this time. And on that land, you've got to build a self-sustainable community and then from there, have a huge Instagram following and a YouTube following and now become really, 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 really famous in what you do. Not just a normal 9 to 5 job. It's not 9 to 5 anymore. It's 24-7 because you're the brand. Not only do you have to find love in a marriage, you have to explore polyamory. You have to have a harem. Sometimes you'll be judged for not being poly enough. You have to not only find marriage now, you have to find your twin flame. Yeah. There's all these other things you have to do. If you're not, you're not spiritual enough. Now, when you do become spiritual enough, people will judge you because that isn't real tantra. That isn't real yoga. My meditation is better than your meditation. My guru is better than your guru. Has anyone experienced any of this stuff? Just me, huh? Okay. <laughs> oh, that takes a lot of therapy. <laughs> I spent seven thousand pounds on that. So uh, <laughs> I need to come to you again. It's happening again. So the Enlightenment race becomes another race, another matrix, and again, not only the only way to win that is to burn out so it's a it usually takes many years in the in this race to actually get to the top which is um any burnt out healers in the house yeah so uh you just want to help people at the end of the day and you found a way to help people because you helped yourself it's embodied wisdom and you know like i said i believe in humans we're nice actually we actually do want to help and serve so once we uh, discovered the enlightenment race, we do want to be the best. I discovered a thing called Tantra. Tantra. Uh, there's all these aspects to Tantra, which is a mantra, which uh, I have a mantra that I share with the world. So everybody repeat after me. I love my life. I love my body. I love myself. So that's the baseline mantra last year i went to a fest and a few millionaires we were hanging out doing a little ritual together uh, one of them said there's a missing piece of that mantra which is and i love making 10 grand a day but the new mantra is i love my life i love my body i love myself and i love making 10 grand a day i could be very careful where i say that because in some places they hate people who have money and in other places, 10 grand a day is a joke because they're multi, multi-millionaires. So I'm very cautious where I share a final piece with. So mantra became a really powerful tool for me to heal. I realized that a lot of deities were visiting me in my uh, meditations, in my tantric rituals. I met Shiva, Om Namo Shiva, that became a powerful mantra. My job eventually beca uh, became... I had to embody Shiva in order for me to give my, my sessions. I discovered a thing called Yoni Massage, Yoni Dearmoring, Yoni Healing, Yoni Mapping. Um, it became my job to worship women. So I became one of the few men around the world that became really good at holding a safe space, creating a, a package for women to heal. Um, I often say if, if we're in a simulation and it's a computer game, you might want to work your way up. A lot of people in the enlightenment race will start here and then work up to this one, this one, and this one, and stay up there. And they would disown power, willpower, emotion, sensuality, and the root chakra, like the lower hearts. And the other people in the other worlds would be like into this part of the chakra system and forget about this one. So there's always a bit of, again, rivalry. Uh, spiritual one-upmanship and a lot of judgment 
And I also found I lived long enough in these spiritual communities. Not only was I did, did I become really good at my job, I actually became I just repackaged the unicorn stuff to Tantra. So I tr created the 10 principles uh, to your sacred sexual awakening. I completely repackaged the whole unicorn thing and repackaged and redesigned myself and did the whole thing for Tantra. And it worked. I became a world famous Tantric sex guru. People loved me. People didn't care I was a unicorn. I was transitioning from unicorn to Tantra. And I became a Tantracorn. And that brand was really big as well. And I just slowly transitioned from being an alcoholic and a drug addict and a complete hot mess to being sober, still identifying as a lesbian unicorn. But with the Tantra stuff, I actually saved my father's life in 2017. He had a stroke. Uh, I healed the connection with my father. I actually stepped into my masculine power. Daddy loves me now. Uh, a lot of the Tantra stuff is all connected with um, sexual well-being. It's actually all connected to mummy and daddy. That's the bulk of my work that I do. Uh, I mainly deal with lots of women who have daddy issues. And that's how my methods work with that. That's a core issue. Um, and all the women eventually started saying, Shaft, you need to start helping men. What you're doing is really powerful. And I was brainwashed by women because in the spiritual scene, there's no men back then. There's hardly any men. There's only just me and a couple of other dackers we were known as. And we believed the women. It was like, yeah, men don't want to do this work. Um, men are definitely narcissists because that's all I hear from the complaints of women. Um, men are definite, definite predators. Women do not want to be seduced. They need to be uh, made felt safe. Boundaries is everything. So I lost my ability to flirt. I lost my ability to seduce. I became very safe. Um, I learned, about, well, boundaries and consent is the primary foundation of everything. It's about embodied awareness. Uh, my nervous system is super relaxed. And I became the man that every woman is praying for which made me invisible to women. What does that mean? My job was flourishing. My love life was too. But it got to a point where more and more people came into the world of Tantra and Tantra got diluted. And now it's just like a spiritual McDonald's. And it is a shit show out there. So once upon a time, everyone wanted to do Tantra to reach enlightenment. That's the whole point. There's 112 meditations to uh, self-realization in the original tantric text. It's all very sweet. I teach all of that stuff, but I found all the sexy stuff and I love relationships. So I concentrated on that. So my business is based around sexual wellness. And I became really good at it. I developed my own systems, my certification programs. I went up that spiritual uh, enlightenment race and won it. And eventually... After seven years, I started seeing a pattern that I was being lied to again. First time from patriarchy in the rat race, and then it was matriarchy in the enlightenment race. There are no dudes. It was just men. Oh, sorry, women. And it was very much a toxic environment for me. I didn't know any of this until I tapped out two years ago. It was a lot of victims helping victims. A lot of people um, teaching people that if you have sex, you'll pick up bad juju inside of you and you pick up all of their traumas so everyone started to not have sex anymore. They would go for a womb cleanse, which was only meant to be a, a, a short period of time. Like, give it a go for 21 days to three months. There's people in my community still going through their womb cleanse to this day. There became more and more separation between men and women to a point that women would rather have a yoni massage, yoni diarming, healing from just women, and men became the problem. Me Too showed up, then uh, men definitely became a problem. And now we see a huge separation, and this is in a bubble, in a bubble, in a bubble. I'm, I'm from a very unique place in the world. Uh, it's a spiritual spiritual community. 
the uh, conscious community and the tantra community. I will not go back there because it's like me going back into the matrix. I've seen too much. I know what a rat race is like, but I'm a little bit more integrated. And I've been away from the spiritual, conscious, tantric scene where I was a big like, pioneer in that community. Any Tantra festival, like I, I swapped the Burning Man festivals for Tantra. I applied the same method for Tantra. And I went on Wikipedia again where all the Tantra festivals and I became a, a Tantric rock star. I, I actually was um, not self-identifying, but everyone said I was a Tantric guru. So everyone just thought I was a guru, and I was like, fuck it, I'll go with it. Yes, I am a guru, but I would always uh, quote the Tony Robbins, you know, um, guru means from darkness to lightness. We've all been through the darkness. And I used to do it with a fake Indian accent. We've all lived in the dark, and now we're coming to the light. I am the guru, you are the guru. And I even did a comedy show called The Urban Guru. And I go around the world doing all of this stuff because it's one big fucking joke after a while. And if you're not laughing about it, you're crying about it. And everyone's crying about it in the spiritual enlightenment race in the bubble I was in. Look at my wounds. I have a certificate about it. Look at my wounds and my trauma. This is me now. And they will get indoctrined into a belief system, which is, this is the worst one, you will never heal. This healing cycle will go on forever. You're not ready to find a man in your life. Remember, it's victims helping victims. You need to be perfect for your king to show up. Uh, be celibate until your king shows up. Your twin flame, sorry, your twin flame. And this is the worst sales pitch, and I have no idea why people buy into it. It's literally mental. To find love, your twin flame, you have to burn through the karma. It's going to be like a horrible relationship. Oh, I'll buy into that. And then you'll be ha you won't be happy, but you'll it's it's a really, really tough challenge and you've got to work for and you've got to heal in that relationship. Now, again, I've lived in these communities long enough to see it see it evolve into just hell on earth. Floating mental asylums on these islands and communities. Where they it's usually one person into another person. That person's obsessed by this person. This person doesn't actually know they're in a relationship half the time. Doesn't even know they're in a relationship. They haven't had the conversation. So it's kind of peculiar that this fucked up brainwashing around the twin flame codes is the foundation of relationships. This fucked up way of thinking that you will never heal is going around polluting the planet. Now it's on Instagram. Now it's on TikTok. Now we have hypersensitive people, which is cool. Highly empathic people, which is cool and trendy. Some people don't even know why they feel the way they feel, but they are going through the process because of these fucking devices telling them how to feel. If Tantra was more portrayed in a better light, which is the original biohacking, which is the original way just to utilize your body, it's not just orgies and orgasms, it's actually how to say no, how to say yes, how to feel into your body, how to feel desire, actually follow your desire. There are no Buddhas out there, but you can reach enlightenment, um, who, who is killing their ego. Like, you have to kill your ego. What the fuck? I've, I've always been very anti this. I'm like, okay, you guys, you do you and do what works. But every seven years, I will change. My, scientifically, biologically, every seven years, my cells will change. My brain changes. I'm just a new person. And why not do what Madonna does or do what David Bowie did, which is reinvent yourself every seven years. Back then, ChatGPT didn't exist, but Wikipedia did again. And uh, I was like looking at the seven year cycles and I'm 44 now. And I look back at my life every second, uh, every seven years, my life changed according to the machine that told me what will happen from 35 to 42 was my Jesus Christ Messiah phase. I was like, I went through that and it was fucking great. 
And 42 onward is my business owner phase, my financial awakening, which is what I call it. I'm like, oh, oh I'm going through that right now. It's, it's really challenging, but it's a, it's a season of my life and it's the next seven years and I will crack the wealth code. Now I'm transitioning from the um, enlightenment. Well, I'm, I tapped out of the enlightenment race two years ago. I reached enlightenment. I did it. I teach it. It's not actually that hard. Um, anyone actually can be enlightened. It's, it's very simple meditations from the original tantric text. It's, uh, they, uh, Eckhart Tolle talks about it. The gaps between the thoughts, just extending the gaps between the thoughts. It's a simple meditation practice where um, I read it. I was like, I can make a better version of that. So I teach this all around the world. Everybody, if you just breathe like this and breathe like this, then you won't have thoughts for at least five minutes. I always do a little, I call them party tricks now. Um, in, in the book itself, it says, if you can have no mind for five minutes, you are fully enlightened. And obviously everyone's getting uh, spiritual uh, fast food these days and people don't believe enlightenment is even possible. But for, for those seven years when I left England, I went deep into Tantra. All I did were these Tantric rituals in these ashrams and mystery schools every day for seven years. If you're doing something for seven days, uh, every day for seven years, and you don't have a job, you don't have to worry about commuting, you don't have children, uh, you don't have to worry about cooking food, everything's provided, and your only purpose is to reach enlightenment, You'll definitely reach enlightenment. It's like a monk living in a cave because you've got no distractions. So it's possible. I just want I just want to give all you you lot hope and faith that you can reach enlightenment. It's not such a big deal because you still need to pay your mortgage and look after the kids and commute. It's a fun part of your life to master and then take it and integrate it into your life. So I had to eventually tap out of the spiritual, tantric, conscious community because it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I have everything to do with fucking it up. Do you know why? 2017, another TV company. Because I, perfectionists, overachievers, whatever I do, I will get good at it. And then the national newspapers will find out and TV companies will find out because I like to be famous. <laughs> I'm a middle child. I've done a lot of therapy and I understand why I want to be famous. It's because I want love for mummy and daddy. Because I'm a middle child. Because my older brother, he got all the love. My younger brother, he got all the love. And my sister, she's the only daughter, so she got all the love. I didn't get jack shit. So I got attached to drinking and taking drugs. Taking drugs to reach that cozy feeling of mother, which I never got. So I'm hyper self-aware and I teach this stuff and I get it. Also, being famous for me meant I didn't have to worry about marketing. Marketing's super hard in sales. But I just got really good at being me. And then other people do the marketing for me. So I got world recognition. So I became the go-to guy for Yoni massages. And that's what I wanted to be. So I did it. I also say in this documentary that changed the world, Ten, the documentary is called 10 Questions You Want to Ask a Tantric Sex Guru. It brought Tantra to the masses. Before that, the only time you heard about Tantra was American Pie, Syphilis Mom, and uh, Sting. And that was it. Now Tantra's everywhere. Tantra's on Mind Valley. Tanya Bibi, Layla Martin. It all came from this era when I decided to get this video out there. People are quoting my quotes from that video. And they think it's from somebody else. It's not. It's from me. And I say that I want Tantra to be the new yoga. Tantra is so watered down now. And no one really knows what it is. That it's a mess. And I made that happen. And I apologize. <laughs> that I fucked it up for everyone. <laughs> And for two years, I've been out of that community. And it's been really nice to not be surrounded by broke, woke, traumatized, celibate hippies. When you're happy in a community like that, they will drag you down. 
when you actually want to better yourself and make a bit of money, they would say you're evil. So I had to get out of there because I found a new hobby, my financial awakening. Now I'm in another race. You know which one I call this one? It's not. It's kind of a not. It's called the impact race. So I believe that Mind Valley is one of the forerunners of the impact race. Again, I found a new toy. I found a new festival. Have you seen? Notice a pattern in what I'm doing. So the pattern is the best festival you could do when you're drunk is Burning Man. Best festival you could do when you're sober is Tantra festivals. Best uh, festival to do when you want money is Mind Valley. <laughs> I'm smart. I figured it out. I talk about this stuff over and over again because it's a big joke. It's a big performance. It's a big computer game. Whatever you want to call it, it's just fun. The hardest part of becoming, being part of the impact race and becoming a multi, multi, multi millionaire is it isn't the journey itself. You know what it is? It's those broke, woke, traumatized spiritual hippies judging you making you feel bad for wanting to have a bit of fame a bit of fortune what does fame and fortune mean fame means you're really good at being you you've helped a lot of people if you help enough people people will start paying you for what you do because you've got a mortgage and some kids you've got to pay for and then you become super rich doing it and then you get more hate more people going, this is a bad person for what, having desire. And that desire to just better yourself and help people. Because like I said at the beginning, I believe humans are actually good people. Because when we find something, I found a new toy. Someone else, play with it. Play with me. It's a new toy. And that's what I found with like getting rich. I got broke-ass mates from the broke quote spiritual hippie. Guess who they're messaging for help. I see you with vision. Can you get me in there? I'm like, you have the same opportunity as me. Pay three and a half grand or four and a half grand. Go to the same places. Here's a list of all the places I've gone to. Here's all the click funnels and things and everything that I created my business on. I got a cheaper version of that. I even make fucking apps now. So anyone can make an app. So you can have your own mind valley. Find out transformationalrockstars.com. Like that's my tech business company now. So anything is actually possible. But there's a common thread of judgment in all of these. No matter what you do, it will never be enough. And that's another, that is another terrible programming I got given in the spiritual conscious tantra scene. I was definitely enough. Like I was, I was happy being chat. I didn't have that not enoughness. I learned about it in, um, in Tantra and spirituality, and even Tony Robbins talks about it, I always felt like I was enough. But I felt like there was something wrong with me because everyone else didn't feel like they were enough and I was missing out on something. Now, I feel like shit most of the time because I really do feel like I'm not enough now. It was not my story. It was not my programming. A lot of people. Now, I work with judgment and I realize that being in the wrong environment isn't the place to be. So I was sober. Not a lot of sober people out there who are wealthy. They drink or do something. I'm sexy. In the sober world, everyone's a bit of a hippie. I like clothes. I like designing my own clothes. So I was just stuck there. Because I was sober. I couldn't find any other sober communities. But then I found this community two years ago, and a lot of people are sober. Not everyone, but more people than not. And guess what? No one judged me. No one judged me. So I stopped judging myself. Finally, I had people to play with. Not only did they not judge me, they actually saw me as a position of authority and I went from zero money to 144k in one year. I finally had money. I could buy clothes from Reese now. I never even knew what Reese is. 
until Vision said you got to buy some good clothes so you could come to A Fest. You can't dress like a guru. And I was like, okay, I'll do it, whatever it takes. Now I get passed around with all the millionaires like a sexy sadhu or guru where I actually help millionaires find love. I'm actually praised and celebrated, which is really nice now. And I'm not judged ever. It's really, really nice not to be judged. And everyone's really encouraging and really supporting. So the moral of the story is, you do you. If anyone else is doing themselves, just say good for you. Crack on. You've got my support. <laughs> Realise that everything is just a game and a race. And the only person playing that game is you. The only winner and competition that you're playing against is just you. Mummy and daddy already love you. You don't need their approval. <laughs> the hardest part of assimilation is other people's judgments. When you get really good at something, people will put you on a pedestal and try and shoot you down. People will make up lies about you because you're successful. They'll say you're evil. I mean, you haven't become that successful yet for that to happen yet. Trust me, it happens. And that's when you spend £7,000 on therapy to, uh, you know, rise above it. How the fuck do you rise above judgment when, you don't, when you're actually just trying to help people and people judge you? That involves a lot of deep therapy. <laughs> when everybody calls you something, you eventually start to believe it because you haven't got anywhere else to go. That's it. This is, this is the enlightenment race. That's when you go inside and that's when you find fulfillment. So even when you play any other games now, you'll always have that. You'll always have that connection to God. So I, so I always talk about enlightenment. That means that connection to God, something bigger than yourself. And that's just inner sanctum. That is that place that makes you feel peace every day. And you have to connect to that every day in a way that you have discovered on your journeys. And you could have malas, you could have mindful masturbation, you could have sex magic rituals, you could have something sober, not constantly going to an ayahuasca journey every single weekend to feel that. One of the, uh, one of the inner mantras is, friends that pray together, stay together. Yeah. Exactly. So the enlightenment race, I did get something good from that. I got enlightened. And you do that every day. I've been Shaft Udin. This has been Tantra of Shaft. There's one more lecture tomorrow. I've got a workshop tonight, Temple of Intimacy, very different to this. Uh, if you want to connect with other like-minded individuals, it's going to be at his house, uh, in a beautiful penthouse. Uh, come along, check out the tribe event, uh, Temple of Intimacy, and just do the process through that. Um, and I'll see you there. If you want to know more about my work, um, find me on tantraofshaft.com. If you want to book a session or anything, or hands-on healing, or you know more about yoni massages, the armoring, and things like that, check out sacredsexualawakening.com. And if you want your own app and have huge impact in the impact race, make sure you follow me or my team on uh, transformationrockstars.com, and we will build you your own app and we'll take everything, take care of everything that you need. We're like a whole team that. Take care of rock stars so you can be on a stage and we'll do the rest. So thank you. I love you. And I set you free. And find me on Instagram because they just taken down my YouTube. <laughs> Shafted it.